Welcome, and thank you for joining my presentation on how the American film industry has altered its relationship with Native Americans since 1990. I am Tom Ferenkopf, my pronouns are they, them, and my contact information is listed here. My research has been conducted through both the McNair Scholars Program and the University of Oregon's Department of Cinema Studies. My academic advisor is Dr. Ari Pranama, whom I cannot thank enough. Additionally, I would also like to thank Dr. Christabel Dragu, Dr. Priscilla Avaye, Dr. Michael Aronson, and Denise Elder, along with the many others that have aided in my research. As a cinema studies and sociology student here at the University of Oregon, I maintain a strong desire to bring these two fields together, hoping to gain a deeper understanding of how one influences the other. It is with this in mind that I explored a number of possible research areas before asking the following question. How, if at all, has the American film industry altered its relationship with Native Americans since 1990? So, during this presentation, I will cover the following key areas. First, I will cover some of the historically utilized Native American stereotypes within the American film industry. Then, I will provide some examples from both Dances with Wolves and then Montford the Chickasaw Rancher. Moving on then to an examination of employment practices. And before wrapping up with my research conclusions, I'll provide some information about why representation matters. Utilizing representation as a means of understanding the relationship between Native Americans and the American film industry, I selected to examine two films in an attempt to shed light on the possible changes that have occurred. First, Dances with Wolves has been called a watershed and that no Western has had such a powerful impact. Angela Elise, film scholar. As a child, this film had a tremendous impact on my experience as an American. Without a full understanding of the dark history between the colonials and indigenous, my introduction to Native American culture was one that revered their existence. Around the same time that Dances with Wolves was receiving numerous awards, including seven Academy Awards, the cultural shift was taking the form of governmental policy changes. In the immediate years that followed its release, government policies such as the renaming of Custer National Monument to Little Bighorn National Monument and the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act remain examples of how the government was moving away from previous policies which included the total annihilation. On the other end of the time spectrum, I have selected to examine Montford the Chickasaw Rancher, a contemporary example of Native American filmmaking. In addition to being produced by the Chickasaw Nation Productions, filmmakers boast that over 200 Native American cast and crew members worked on the production of this film. Through an examination of representation, I believe there is information that can be gained about possible changes that have occurred. To further understand this idea, this research utilizes a comparative analysis approach to examine two key areas of representation. First, on-screen representation of Native Americans has typically been relegated to one-dimensional stereotypical characters. As will be discussed later, the impact of on-screen portrayals has a lasting effect on those who identify with the presented group. Second, this research looked at the hiring practices and those employees who were selected to fill key roles in the creative and directing processes. Through this examination, we are capable of ascertaining who is responsible for telling these stories. While stereotypical representations of Native Americans remain numerous, I will cover six areas that directly connect to the examined films. The use of whitewashing, where a white actor takes on a Native American character role, continues to occur even in more recent films. In Disney's 2013 film, The Lone Ranger, Johnny Depp portrays a combination of Crow and Cree Native Americans. This is also known as acting in red face. Then there is the white savior. This stereotype is fulfilled when a white character has significant interactions with a Native American person or tribe and wants to help save them from the next group of colonizers. The act of going native is when a white character decides to shed their cultural practices and fully assimilate into the lifestyle of Native Americans and is often depicted as being accepted as a cultural member. As first discussed by Professor of American Indian Studies, M. Elise Marubio, the celluloid princess is a common female Native American character that, to her own peril, aligns herself with the white colonizer, which usually leads to her own demise. Next is that of the noble medicine man. This character type is often considered the spiritual or holy person for the tribe, and more often than not has the singular purpose of providing guidance to the white characters. 
Another common stereotype is that of the bloodthirsty warrior or savage. Often depicted as attacking white settlers unprovoked, these images are filled with Native Americans raping white women. Now, turning to Dances with Wolves. For sake of time and in recognition of the many scholars who have previously committed their thoughts and examination of this film for to academia, this presentation will not extensively cover the stereotypes presented. Instead, I have cited numerous works in my paper, and there are many others whose work is available for consideration. That being said, I will loosely cover a few examples from both Dances with Wolves and then Montford the Chickasaw Rancher. Stands with Fist, portrayed by Christine Gunther, is a stereotypical version of the celluloid princess. While her story is not exactly as Mar Rubio expresses it, I believe she falls into the same category. The primary difference is that Stands with Fist is only a small child when bloodthirsty warriors portrayed as Pawnee murder her parents. When the noble Lakota medicine man finds her in the wilderness, he takes her in as his own, Unbar, and they eventually are married in what is portrayed as a traditional Lakota wedding. Acting as the main translator of the noble medicine man Kicking Bird, Stands with Fist becomes the channel for which all conversations can exist. Another fundamental component of the celluloid princess is that her activities usually result in her own demise. The same is implied with Stands with Fist. After Dunbar decides to leave the Lakota camp, Stands with Fist, as his wife, decides to leave the tribe for good, abandoning the only home she's known for most of her life. After relocating to the abandoned Fort Sedgwick, U.S. Army Lieutenant John Dunbar, played by Kevin Costner, takes over all day-to-day -day operations. Then, after establishing regular communications with the nearby Lakota people, Dunbar is invited to participate in some of the tribe's more sacred practices, like the buffalo hunt. As Dunbar continues to travel to the Lakota camp, he increasingly abandons his post at Fort Sedgwick. After surviving many months without additional troops or supplies, Dunbar decides to fully assimilate into the Lakota tribe and lifestyle, or going native, as previously discussed. When he realizes he's left a trail of information that will lead the army right back to the tribe, he decides to retrieve it, only to find a large encampment at Fort Sedgwick. As a result, Dunbar is ultimately arrested and transported to the nearest courthouse. During his transport, numerous Lakota warriors attack the army troops and bring Dunbar back to their new camp location. It is only after his return that Dunbar believes his presence will ensure the U.S. Army will come looking for him and potentially harm people of the tribe. In his ultimate act as the white savior, Dunbar gives up his place in their society in hopes of returning to white society and ending the brutal murders of Native Americans. Portrayed by Graham Greene, the noble or stoic medicine man known as Kicking Bird plays a significant role throughout the film. Upon his first contact with Dunbar, Kicking Bird convinces other Lakota people of the importance in communicating with Dunbar. Offering up his own adopted daughter, Stands with Fist, he convinces her to make the white words and open lines of communication. Over the course of the movie, his character perpetuates this stereotype as his primary purpose is to provide guidance to Lieutenant Dunbar. Now, let us turn our attention and examine the on-screen portrayals of Native Americans in Montford the Chickasaw Rancher. Early on in the film, Monfort is quickly identified as a half-breed by U.S. Army Sergeant Richter. While it is a historical fact that Monfort was born to Rebecca Johnson, his Chickasaw mother, and Charles Johnson, his father of English descent, the identification of the half-breed stereotype appears to be an attempt at subverting this idea and dismissing it. During this sequence, Sergeant Richter announces to the commanding officer, this is the half-breed I was telling you about. Similar to the idea of Lieutenant Dunbar in Dances with Wolves, Charles Boggy Johnson, as portrayed by Dermont Mulroney, is representative of the white savior. After abandoning his family for more than 30 years, Boggy returns to Monford's ranch and attempts to rekindle the lost relationships. Then, after nearby Native men are captured by the U.S. Army and transported to a military prison in St. Augustine, Florida, Boggy talks his way into joining Monfort because he has friends in high places. While at the prison, Boggy utilizes his place of privilege to call upon elected officials to try and persuade the military officers into releasing the indigenous men. Filmmakers briefly utilize the stoic stereotype in a short sequence where Monfort meets a group of local indigenous leaders. 
During this scene, the characters maintain both a rhythmic tone during their conversation and stoic expressions. Additionally, it is important to note that both films are representative of the Plains Indian stereotypes. However, due to the historical accuracy based on Monfort T. Johnson's life, and that his cattle empire stretched across several plain states, the inclusion of this stereotype is subverted. Now, having examined a few of the on-screen examples, let us turn our attention to the hiring practices that occur off-screen. In selecting a specific subset of all the roles filled within each production, I chose a specific framework to understand who maintained creative control over the production process. Within the cinematic field, employment positions are described relative to a line. Those positions with creative control are considered to be above the line, and those who fill trade positions are considered to be below the line. That being said, this research focuses on above the line positions and include the following roles. Director, writer, executive producer, casting director, cinematographer, and the top 10 acting roles listed in each of their respective film credits. To gain an understanding of these positions, I have utilized publicly available information for each person. As we can see here, my research indicates that Dances with Wolves employed no Native American filmmakers outside of acting roles. When compared to Monford the Chickasaw Rancher, there is an increase in the number of Native Americans employed in these positions, most notably in the writing and producing roles. The unknown portion of this data is due to no publicly available information for screenwriter Lucy Tennessee Cole, and will change these numbers if information becomes available. Chickasaw Nation Productions, the principal company of Montford, has publicly claimed that over 200 Native American cast and crew members worked on this film. While I have not been able to independently verify this claim, the Oklahoma Gazette has published the statements of Paul Sermons, one of the film's producers. Having discussed how representation has changed both in front of and behind the camera, I'm now going to look at why change is important and why representation matters. A significant reason as to why representation in film matters is because it can have an influencing factor on how children view their own racial makeup. It provides visual examples that claim to be similar or same as their own. With an emphasis on the material conditions of social life, representation is a means of understanding our place in the world. The UCLA Sociology Department, for a number of years, has compiled annual representation statistics in Hollywood. The following information is from the 2022 report representing the employment practices in 2021. In the field of directors and of the 252 Hollywood films produced in 2021, only two roles were filled by Native Americans, and this compares to the 175 roles that were filled by their white counterparts. When we examine the acting roles, leading and overall, Native Americans represent less than 1% in each category. And in the last category, where Native Americans are even listed, the writer's department reflects the same low employment numbers. However, I have observed one phenomenon that has been growing since the 1990s, and one that piqued my interest. In researching these films, I came to understand that Chickasaw Nation Productions is the principal company responsible for creating Monford the Chickasaw Rancher. And to be honest, this was the first time I learned of a production company owned and operated by Native Americans. In further researching this topic, I have found at least 13 Native American production companies, and of all these companies, 10 were founded during the time between these two films. While I currently believe this is simply a correlation, the fact that these production companies exist is in one way how the American film industry has changed over the last 30 years. So in conclusion, after having examined the on-screen portrayals, the off-screen hiring practices, why representation matters, and how underrepresentation has continued in major hubs like Hollywood, I believe there is evidence of a shift in the representation of Native Americans within the American film industries. While this research is not an exhaustive examination of all films produced during this period, this comparison does reflect a measurable change. However, with the significant increase in the number of Native American film production companies, 
Owning the means of production is one way in which Native Americans are reclaiming their stories and telling them from their point of view. Thank you.